Hey, good morning, Christ Church. How are we doing today? Yeah, doing well. Glad to see you here. Uh, if you are joining us for the first time or for the first time in a long time, I want to introduce myself. My name is Drake. I get to serve as one of the ministers here at Christ Church, and uh, we are so grateful you have joined our gathering. I want to tell you a little bit about this church through the lens of uh, the almost seven years that my wife and I have been a part of this community. It'll be seven years next month, and we love being a part of this community. Uh, for the people here are absolutely wonderful. I mean, we are welcomed with open arms. We've developed uh, some of our favorite friendships here at Christ church. Uh, this church has been with us in the adoption of our first son, the birth of our second son. It has just been a blessing to us. And the big things and the small things, even like the small thing that we did yesterday, a very kind family from this church invited us to go uh, fishing at their pond. And both of my sons, Willie and Murph, caught their very first fish yesterday. I mean, hooked them, reeled them in, kissed the fish. You know what I'm saying? It was the, the full package. And uh, this church is just so full of wonderful, loving, kind people who have completeness in Jesus and are growing in their relationship with him, expressing the love of God uh, to others. So I hope if you're new with us that you will continue to engage and plug in. And if you see somebody here, maybe from your workplace or your neighborhood, go out and introduce yourself or shake their hand and say, hey, I didn't know you went here and get connected with them. I'm going to spare those of you who, you know, come to our gatherings regularly from the moment uh, where you have to stand up and shake the hands of people next to you. But I am going to ask that you shake people's hands in the lobby and you get to know people. I mean, it's a great day to shake somebody's hand. You know what I'm saying? Great day to go to lunch with somebody, too, if you're hungry. This is going to be a good day. You feeling it? If you're looking for opportunities to plug in here at Christ Church that aren't as awkward as shaking a stranger's hand, uh, we have an opportunity. Well, you're going to shake some strangers' hands at these opportunities as well. First off is the ladies' night, which is tomorrow night. Where are the ladies at in the room? You hear? All right, there you go. Uh, ladies' night tomorrow night uh, in SMC North, a fun time of uh, fellowship and eating and celebrating a local ministry uh, in our area, Neighborhood Lifehouse, led by our very own uh, Addie Jarrett. I have been told that I am not invited, but I'm supposed to invite you. So I hope that you go to the ladies' night tomorrow night uh, over at SMC North. If you have questions, you can reach out to our women's minister, Teresa, and uh, she'd be happy to give you any information you need. Now, there is something that I am invited to and all the men in the room are invited to. Men, where are you at? You out there? All right, a little deeper. I like it. It's the men's breakfast uh, this Friday. Uh, we're going to have a couple of speakers, Michael and Beth DeFazio, talking about healthy relationships and investing in the next generation. Uh, we're going to have some breakfast. It's going to be awesome. It's at the Mining Days Event Center in Webb City. If you have questions, you can contact our men's minister. His name is Spencer. He is awesome. He'd love to go to coffee or lunch with you. Uh, if you are new with us, these are two great opportunities for you to get involved. And if you've been with Christ Christ Church for a while, two great opportunities for you to continue to engage uh, with brothers and sisters here in this community. Church, I really, really do hope that you continue to plug in and you experience the blessings of relationship that my wife and I have experienced here at Christ Church for almost seven years now. With that being said, we're going to uh, begin our worship service, and I want to read a call to prayer from Psalm 63. So if you would, go ahead and stand right where you are as we kick off this service. This is the psalm of David from Psalm chapter 63. David wrote, You, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you. In a dry and parched land where there is no water, I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live, and in your name I will lift up my hands. I will be fully satisfied as with the richest of foods, with singing lips my mouth will praise you. Christ Church of Orinogo is a group of people working to find completeness in Jesus and having completeness in him. It is in Christ alone that we have the fullness of life. Let's sing praises to our God. storm that surrounds me 
Just one word The darkness has to retreat Just one touch I feel the presence of heaven Just one touch My eyes were open to see My heart can't help but believe There's nothing that I God can't do There's not a mountain that He can move Oh, praise the name that makes a way There's nothing that our God can't do Just one word You heal what's broken inside me Just one word
step down from glory to where my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The King of kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours for Was expressing my love for this community and and how good the people uh, here are and I want to let you know if you're joining us the reason that this community is so loving and so kind is because we gather under uh, not the name of any person who is in this room but under the name of Jesus we come to this place understanding that we are followers of Christ and we're having completeness in him and each week we come to this moment in our service where we take uh, the bread and we take the juice and we consume it in an act of remembrance of Jesus Jesus, the one whose name under we gather. And in this moment, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, if you are a follower of him, united with him in a death like his, and you will also be united with him in a resurrection like his, I invite you to fixate your mind on Jesus in this time, to remember him, to celebrate him, and to proclaim his death until he comes. If you're joining with us and you're not a follower of Jesus, I'm going to ask that you let the trays pass by you and take this time to reflect on Jesus. And and consider the things that you have heard about him, maybe from this church or other churches. And if you have any questions today about who Jesus is and what it means to follow him, uh, I would love to have a conversation with you. There's other staff and volunteers who are about in the Welcome Center that would love to have a conversation with you on who Jesus is and what it means to follow him. Uh, but church, as we gather in this moment to take this meal, would you fixate your minds on Jesus, proclaiming his death until he comes? Let's pray. Uh, Father, in this time, we remember Jesus, and uh, we celebrate his death to uh, be reminded that 
As those who follow him, we are united with him in a death like his. And we believe there will be a day that we will be united with him in a resurrection like his when he comes and returns. Father, we are grateful for uh, your love for us expressed through Christ Jesus. And uh, Father, in this time as we remember him and celebrate him, uh, we express our gratitude to you through him. In Jesus' name then we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us here at Christ Church. Whether you are checking us out for the first time or you're coming back to our online weekly gathering, our hope is that you have an experience with Jesus that makes you long for more. The truth is our lives were made for Him and we believe that we can experience the fullness of the life He offers by participating in the life of the church, which isn't a building to occupy or a screen to observe, but the community of people who call Jesus King. So we would love to invite you to come to our in-person gatherings, which we have on Thursdays at 645 and Sundays at 8, 915 and 1045. We know that not everyone's circumstances allow them to gather in person, but we believe that experiencing Jesus can't be complete if it's only contained to an hour of an online service. And we want more than that for you. We want you to join a community of Jesus followers and consume the Word of God, the bread and the cup of the Lord's table, the encouragement found as many worship Him, but to also give that you would be a blessing by singing, listening, sacrificing, and being an encouragement to others who need your life and testimony to remind them of the greatness of our God. If you have more questions about Christ Church, we are here for you. We'd love to connect and together experience completeness in Jesus. All right, church, I ask you to take a moment to fixate on Jesus, and here he is uh, in the flesh. He is with us. This is uh, no Christ Church. If you haven't met him, I want to introduce you to Mac. Mac, this is Christ Church, or at least the second hour uh, of Christ Church. Mac and his wife, Olivia, their daughters, Heidi and Hallie, are ministry partners of Christ Church. They're serving in Poland and have been doing so for a while. They're on a furlough this semester, serving at Ozark Christian College. But uh, I wanted Mac to share a little bit with you about who they are and what they're doing. So, Mac, share with us, man. Yeah, so my wife and I have been working with a Polish organization called pro and Ministries, uh, which was started in the early 90s um, by a Polish man named Władysław Dwulat. And, uh, and we call him Maui because he's tall, and in Polish, Maui means small. So Maui started this organization, and I went to visit this organization in the summer of 2017, and God gave us a very specific, very clear call. And so my wife and I finished Ozark at 2018, neither of us with missions degrees, neither of us thinking about doing church planting, neither of us thinking we would ever go anywhere other than where we had been before. And God decided that all of those ideas were cool, but not his. And so my wife and I, after receiving a call, sold everything that we owned. We asked churches and individuals to please help us fulfill what we believe God has called us to do, and that was to do church planting in the city of Piotrkov, Poland. So if you kind of see the country of Poland on a map and you put your finger in the center, that's right around where we're at and where we operate. And so we moved to a city of 80,000 Polish people, and 95% of Poles identify as Polish Catholic, and only 200 people in a city of 80,000 were willing to confess on a census that they follow Jesus um, with their lives. And so we work in a pretty rough religious environment and uh, with a lot of religious opposition to the gospel. And we started with, of those 200, we knew of four. We had made four disciples through various processes and relationships that we had built. And we believe that God is going to be worshipped in all of creation and therefore we must plant a church. And so we moved to this city and we, through various means of simply loving on the community and being 
among them and alongside them, especially through these last three very difficult years for, for those of us who've been living in Europe, especially in Eastern Europe, um, living alongside them and ministering to them and evangelizing them one-on-one through conversations about who God is, who Christ is, and how he changes everything. And so we started with four, and we now have a community of about 30, and we're looking forward to beginning weekly services. Though we continue to do a weekly Bible study, we are getting ready to start weekly services in September. And so I just wanted to say we're so grateful for um, churches like yours, like Christ Church of Orinogo, um, who partner with us to be able to fulfill the calling that God has given on our lives. And I tell people, and I told people early on when they asked, um, you know, how, how do you go about doing this whole church planting thing and doing intercultural missions? Um, and I, I recognized that it's pretty obvious early on when you see God call an individual, he never calls someone alone, he calls a community. And that has absolutely been our experience. And we have received received love, God's love, through the churches that we have been able to partner with, who are praying for us, who are providing for us. And so we, as the Johnson family, I as the father, would like to say thank you so much for your partnership in the gospel, that your love to us is God's love to us, that your faithfulness to us is God's faithfulness to us. And we are incredibly grateful to be able to do what we do on your behalf in a part of the world that Hopefully some of you will be able to come visit relatively soon, um, but where you all do not live. And so we're grateful to be your ambassadors, your missionaries in another part of the world. So as we kind of focus our attention on giving, I just wanted to remind us very quickly that we are people who fully believe that God did not consider withholding his son a solid option that God gave us Christ, that is his very heart, his most beloved, the ultimate thing God could give, he gave to us so that we might be reconciled to him. And Paul says, if God gave Christ, how will he not graciously give us everything else? And so that means as people who are fundamentally transformed by the gospel, all the future, all of eternity, all of creation belongs to the saints because we love Christ and Christ is the one whom God glorifies. And so because God gives us all things, we graciously give all things. And so I want to encourage you with that and I will pray as we pass the bags around. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for Jesus Christ and for the freedom that is found in his name. We thank you that you have given us the way to be truly human and to be transformed by your spirit and now to live fully free lives of gospel obedience with joy. I pray that as we consider our financial assets that we consider you to be more worthy than anything on this earth and that we give out of joy and abundance knowing you have given us far beyond anything that we could give. And I pray that that practice unites our hearts with Christ, and that we might find in this work a full-fledged love and authentic affection for who you are. It is in your son's name we pray that you bless our giving. Amen. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem and they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still looking sad. Then one of them named Cleopas answered him, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, what things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. 
was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he were going farther, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. Luke 24, 13 through 35. Well, good morning, church. I'd love for you to have your Bibles open to Luke 24 this morning. So if you want to open the app or your Bible and have it in front of you, we're going to be going in and out of the scripture, up and down from the beginning to the end. I'm going to show you some things that's found at the end of this series. So if you're joining us here today, we're glad you're with us. My name's Mark. I get to be one of the ministers. And we have been for the last, this is counting the 19th week, we've been 19 weeks in the gospel of Luke in a series we're calling Radical Pursuit. And to be honest with you, outside of the proclamation last week, of the fact that, <laughs> this is two weeks in a row she's got in my way. All right. Okay, so uh, now, so we've been looking at the radical pursuit of Jesus and how he is, uh, came after us. And he came after us when we didn't know we needed him. He came after us when we abused him and misused him and ignored him. And so what do we do now that we know who he is? We answered last week the question, who is Jesus? The resurrection proved who he said he was. It wasn't just the miracles he did. It was overcoming death and freeing us to new life. And we've been answering this question because the angels at the tomb said Jesus had to suffer, die, and be raised. This was all part of God's plan from the foundation of all time. But I want you to know we're still on Easter morning. The text today is, it's been a week since we celebrated it, but it's still that Sunday. It's that Sunday that the women went to the tomb at sunrise, and it was empty. And an angel said that this had to happen. And the women went back to the 11 disciples and said, the tomb is empty, and they thought they were making it up. And then Peter and John went to the tomb and came back, and it said that Peter walked away amazed. He was pondering what was going on. He, he didn't know what to do with it, and it's the same day. We find two men that are walking from Jerusalem back to what we assume is their home in a town called Emmaus. It is seven and a half miles from Jerusalem. Now, the researchers will tell you that they walked about three miles an hour back in those days when they went from place to place. So they were walking two, two and a half hours back to their, their homes on this sad day, and they're very discouraged. What I want to do is I want to use this Luke 24 text to show you how, they, how the transformation in their lives took place. Why would these two men be different in these few verses we just read from when we first meet them? And we'll show the transforming work that Jesus does following the resurrection in all of our lives. So just see that through that lens with me this morning. We begin with the discouragement of a confused heart. They're, they're discouraged and they have a reason to be. It says they're walking back and they're discussing things and Jesus walks up behind them and he asks them, what are you talking about? Well, he knows what they're talking about, yet he just comes up and asks this simple question. Sometimes Jesus asks us questions not because he wants information. He wants to awaken us. He wants us to think, to be repositioned. And he walks up and he says, what are you talking about? He said, haven't you heard everything that's going on this weekend? Jesus of Nazareth was killed in Jerusalem by the religious leaders, and they're discouraged for two reasons. Number one, they... Um, they're going to look at life without a resurrection. Just think about this with me for a few moments. If Jesus, the miracle worker, if Jesus, Jesus, the powerful son of God, if Jesus, the wise teacher is killed and he's dead, what hope is there for any of us? If Jesus can be killed, then we're going to die and there's no hope, there's no resurrection, and they're living their lives discouraged. They're also discouraged <clears throat> because they don't recognize Jesus. His presence is with them and they can't see it. 
Where does this all come from? It comes from a misunderstanding. I want to be really careful. I'm not here to bash these two men. You and I would have been doing the same thing they were doing. They're discouraged because there's a misunderstanding that they're going through. You see, Jesus failed them. Look at verse 21. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. That expression, redeem Israel, is a political term. They thought Jesus was going to change the circumstances. They had anticipated that the Messiah of God, which Jesus was, they thought the Messiah was going to change their economics or the political power, that he was going to put Rome in submission to the Jews, that the Jews would again one day rule the world. And they never ruled the world. They were never told they were going to rule the world. Their expectation of Jesus left them discouraged, and it does to us too. That we can put things on Jesus, that if he's going to be our Savior, he's going to have to do X, and Jesus never intends to do X. So in those moments, following Jesus will be discouraging. When we have expectation on him that he never intended to provide, he never intended to execute. Jesus was right there with them, and because he wasn't visible to them, that he was right there. This was a man they knew. We're going to talk about why in just a few moments, but let that linger for just a few moments. They thought he was going to redeem Israel, and now he's dead. But Jesus came to free them from more than political or economic bondage. Jesus came to, to free us from more than just what's taking place in our circumstances. He went to a deeper bondage, the bondage of sin, the bondage of guilt, the bondage of the fact that we have wronged God by disobeying and, in fact, just mistreating one another, not taking uh, care of his world, not taking care of one another, being selfish and harmful and sinful. The, they wanted a kingdom. Jesus wasn't the kind of king they wanted. But it's not wrong that they wanted a kingdom. Don't get me wrong. The Old Testament prophets said that God was building a kingdom. The poets waxed on about the kingdom that God was producing. Jesus himself said, I come to bring a kingdom. Then what happened to it? Did it fail? Could the world stop God's kingdom? Verse 25, Jesus responds to their discouragement. O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Oh, it's interesting here. Jesus says, no, you've, you have a misunderstanding, but I love this. He doesn't say you're stupid. He doesn't say you know nothing. He says you have a partial understanding and that partial understanding is keeping you from seeing what I'm doing. It's, it's to have our eyes opened and our minds open to all that God is doing around us instead of holding to God to two or three things that we expect him to do if we're gonna honor him at all. It wasn't that they were ignorant, it's that their knowledge was incomplete. And then I wanna go from their discouragement to the fact that there's a moment here where Jesus challenges them. Look at the discovery of what happens to these men when Jesus takes their discouragement, uses it for his purposes, and challenges them to go beyond it. What was Jesus' response to them? Sometimes Jesus wants to discourage us. Sometimes his teaching shows the error of our ways. Sometimes he corrects us. Sometimes he allows us to hold on to things that aren't beneficial to us till we realize the emptiness of them. Oh, you know this, right? If you've raised children at all and they've gone through high school, you know that from the time they're eight or nine, they actually think you know something. And they become 14 to 18 and you know nothing. And then they have their own kids and look how smart I got. <laughs> because they realize they had to experience it and God does the same thing with us. He allows us to test our own wisdom. He allows us to live in our own ways, to understand how unsatisfying they are and how desperate they leave us, how unfulfilling they are. Jesus will discourage us. Verse 15, while they were talking and discussing together, Jesus drew himself near and went with them. I don't want you to miss the beauty of this. Jesus is still, post-resurrection, the one who chases the lost sheep. He's still the one that goes out and brings the young son home, the prodigal, back to the father. Jesus is still the one he's always been. In their discouragement, Jesus doesn't walk up on them and go, oh, they're all bummed out. I'm not dealing with this. No, he actually goes. He left Jerusalem to catch up to them because their discouragement gave him opportunity. He pursued them. He sought them. 
We love him because he first loved us. Look at verse 27. Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near to a village to which they were going. He acted as if he was going to go farther. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed it, broke it, and gave it to them. When Jesus approached them, and he said, what are you talking about? And they said, we're talking about Jesus of Nazareth. Don't you know what happened last, what happened on Friday in Jerusalem? Everyone's talking about it. Everybody knows. Were you not aware there was an earthquake? Were you not aware that the sky went dark? The sun was turned off for three hours. Are you, do you not, were you not around? Now, Jesus could have easily said, dudes, I'm Jesus. But he doesn't. How does he reveal himself? He starts telling them what the scriptures say. He starts connecting the dots historically of what God has been doing from the foundations of the earth. Before man was created, God had a plan, should man rebel against him, of how he would rescue and save them. And it wasn't a plan that people would suffer and be punished. It would be a plan that he would, be, that he would suffer and be punished. And he would provide this hope. But it says in verse 31, when the word of God challenged them with the words of God... Verse 31 says, and their eyes were opened. And this is why they couldn't recognize him. But when he opened the words of God and he revealed what God was doing and how Jesus had to die and to be raised and ascend to the Father, when they understood that God had a plan and this was being performed in front of them, their misunderstanding could be corrected. Their discouragement could become challenge. And it says, and they recognized him. If they had known him, they'd seen him, but they didn't recognize him. Why? Look at verse 16. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. Why did God do that? Because Jesus physically was not going to remain with us. So the words of God would be the replacement for the word of God. Right, you see the symbolism. Jesus is called the word of God by John in the gospel. He would be the communication of God to the world. But he also said, I must leave you and it is beneficial to you that I leave you so my spirit may come. And what Jesus is showing them through this is I'm not gonna reveal myself physically. He was different to them. They were kept from recognizing him because it wasn't important that he was physically with them. It's important that they understood what he was saying. It was important to understand what he was doing on behalf of God, that the word of God would be replaced by the words of God. This is what he told us would happen. And then in verse 32, I love this. They said to each other, did our hearts not burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? You ever had that moment? And I hope you have. Because it's not really as much to do with you. There's a part, it's probably one third you and two thirds God. Have you ever had that moment where someone's opened scripture to you, a scripture you're well aware of, a scripture you've known for years? It might be a preacher like me or a teacher in a classroom. It might be a small group or your own personal study, and you're sitting down and you're reading a passage you've read a hundred times, and all of a sudden something pops, and you're like, where's that been? And all of a sudden you come to life. You're like, oh my gosh, that is so good. I've never seen that before. I never made those connections. You didn't make those connections. The Holy Spirit did. In the perfect time and perfect place, the Holy Spirit said, now you're ready. And your eyes are opened. And they said, did our hearts not burn within us? If I could translate that in the way I speak, it would sound something like this. My tail was wagging. When that came together, I'm like, oh my gosh, that is so good. That makes so much sense. I've always wondered why and now I see it's not because I'm intelligent at all. It's because God uses community and scripture and the Holy Spirit to reveal himself to us. Sometimes God intentionally doesn't reveal himself to us so he can build our faith. So he can. So they go from discouraged to challenged. And I want you to look at the challenge he gives them then. How does God challenge an open heart? He opened the scripture, he opened their eyes. In verse 27, I'd love for you, if you haven't opened your Bibles yet, I'd really love for you, if you have a physical Bible, to open it in front of you, to see it in your own Bible, because I'm gonna ask you to do something that some of you can't do. I want you to write in your Bible. I want you to underline verse 27 of Luke 24. 
I want you to see something I think is significant. I have misread this almost my entire adult life. And then God showed me through another teacher what I was missing. It says, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, this is the key phrase, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. He interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. I used to read this as this. He interpreted to them all the things concerning himself in the scriptures. That's not what he said. What's the difference? There's a difference between Jesus saying, hey, turn to Genesis 3 and then turn to Isaiah 53 and then turn to here and here, I'm in all those passages. That's not what he did. He didn't say, I'm in this one and this one, but not this one, but not this one, but this one and this one and this one. He didn't do that. He actually said, I'm in all of them. And for two and a half, three hours, Jesus walked them down the road and he told them how he was in Genesis and in Exodus and Leviticus and in Numbers and in Deuteronomy and in Joshua and in Judges and in Ruth. And these guys looked at each other and said, dude, was your tail wagging when he was talking? And the other guy's like, I couldn't believe it. My heart was thumping in my chest. My eyes were opened. I thought Jesus was just this king for this moment. I had no idea from the foundations of the earth, God had prepared to send Jesus to do the work that all the Old Testament, the prophets, the poets, the judges, the pro all of them, all the narratives of the stories of Moses' life and Abraham's life was all leading us to understand who Jesus was. And it wasn't his physical appearance that convicted him. It was an understanding of what the word of God had been doing since God began to speak. In the beginning, God created the heavens and earth. And every time God talks, something good happens. And here you have this moment where all the scriptures were demonstrated. In John 5, 39, Jesus said these words. You study the scripture diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me. Can I ask you an honest question? How much money would you pay to have a recording of that three-hour walk? I would give my life's fortune for it. To have my tail wag to hear the voice of Jesus tell me how he connected Genesis all the way through the end. I would listen to it every day, promise you that. Because the moments that the Holy Spirit connects the scriptures together and you see things you've never seen before, the joy of preaching is not standing up here and talking. The joy of preaching is when I look out in a room and something that God connected for me and I mention it to you, have you ever seen this before? And I see your heads go down and you start to write it in your Bibles and on your notepads and I'm like, oh, that meant something to you too. The joy of discovery is actually the joy of sharing. And the Holy Spirit's doing this every day, isn't he? He's taking discouraged believers and he's bringing them into truth by revealing himself slowly and steadily to build our faith. Do you know in your Old Testament there are 333 precise details of Jesus' life written hundreds of years before he was born? 333 statements about the Messiah that Jesus filled by eyewitness account. Let me tell you some of them. Time of his birth, the means of his birth, the place of his birth. What would happen by being taken to Egypt? His manhood, his teaching, his character, his preaching, his reception, his rejection, his death, burial, and ascension, his resurrection. All of these things were prophesied by over 25 different people on a various spectrum of time. The odds of that happening are mathematically impossible that one man could fulfill 333 projected promises from strangers living in a distant land and distant time. Yet it's true. So Jesus said, let me show you for three hours how I'm connected to these promises and these moments in history where they foreshadowed what I was going to do by God's command in all the scriptures concerning himself. They went from confused to challenged. Now let's end this morning with this. What's the declaration of a convinced heart? Something takes place between the 13th and, or 12th and 13th verses. The disciples left the tomb and they were, they were amazed, but they were confused. Something happens here at the end of Luke that's worth noting. This is where we make the transition from Jesus pursuing us to us pursuing him. 
This is the, di- the difference between you letting Jesus chase you and you turning around and following him. It's found right here, verse 28. So they drew near to the village to which they were going, and Jesus acted as if he was going to go on farther. This is interesting. It's getting toward sunset, and they start to head to their home, and he said, I need to keep going further. And they're like, hey, it's late. You probably don't need to be out there on the roads by yourself. How about you stay the night with us, the connection? Have you ever noticed there's sometimes that Jesus seems to want to get away from us? You read the Bible, there's moments like Jesus is like, I need to get away from the crowds and go in there. Sometimes that's intentional. Sometimes he is going to go away and we're going to be fine. But other times, something unique happens. Do you remember in your Old Testament when Jacob is wrestling the angel at night? Remember, he got his hip dislocated and he's wrestling the angel all night long. And the angel says to Jacob, let me go. Stop for a second. Do you think the mighty messenger of God could be pinned by a man? Not a chance. What is the angel doing, faking that Jacob's this big, tough guy? No, God took Jacob down a notch every time he talked to him. What was going on? Jacob says, I won't let you go unless you bless me. And the angel went, there it is. I want you to submit yourself to my power and realize I have something for you. There's moments Jesus walked by thousands of people and never healed him. There was a woman who wasn't a Jew who came to Jesus and said, my daughter is possessed, would you heal her? And Jesus said, I've not come for the Samaritans, I've come for the tribe, I've come for the, the, shep, the sheep of God, his, his people. He said, I can't give the food for children to dogs. And I read that passage and I'm like, dang, Jesus, that's harsh. This loving God just called a woman a dog and this woman looks at him and she says, yeah, but even dogs get scraps from the table and Jesus goes, there it is. He says, your daughter's healed. Your faith has made her well. What are we learning? There are certain things in life that we don't have because we didn't ask. Jacob couldn't hold the angel. The angel said, ask for the blessing. That's why I'm here. Jesus said, ask for the healing. Prove to me that your faith is beyond your identity. There it is. This is why Jesus would say in his great sermon on the mount, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Right now, if you can't see Jesus, and right now, if you can't connect with Jesus, ask. He wants it more than you. He wants to reveal himself at a deeper level to you. It's not about your abilities. It's not about your intellect, your study habits. It's actually about opening yourself up to him. Let him reveal himself to you and watch what happens. You see, in verse 29, they urged him strongly saying, stay with us for it is toward evening and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. And when he was at the table with them, he took the bread, blessed it, broke it and gave it to them. And then it says, and then he disappeared. Wait, what? He sits at the table with them. He comes in, receives their hospitality. He breaks the bread. He takes the cup. He hands it to them. And then he disappears. And we go, what is that all about? Let me tell you what that's all about. The word of God left so that the words of God would be enough. This is my body broken. This is my blood shed. And when he gave them the body and the blood, he gave them the symbols to remind them that the truth was there. How do I know that works? How do I know that God revealing himself to us, even in the symbols of things like the Lord's Supper and baptism and these other things, why do I think they matter? Because God is revealing himself to us and we then no longer ask God to chase us. We begin to pursue him. It's called discipleship. Look what happened in verse 33 and 34. They rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the 11 and those who were with them gathered together, saying, the Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. So we started this day. It's Easter. It's Easter afternoon. The tomb is empty. The disciples have talked about it. These two men decide to go back home and they're very discouraged. They walk two and a half, three hours home. A man joins them on the trip. He tells them some things they stopped thinking about and forgot. They begin to remember and their spirits come to life and their eyes begin to open and they meet this man and they realize when he breaks the bread and hands them the cup, they're like, dude, we've seen this before. And they're like, it's him. And then he's gone because Jesus didn't want them to rely on his physical presence. He wanted them to rely on his promises. And he disappears. And what do they do? At nighttime, They turn around and go back to seven and a half miles to Jerusalem that same night. 
Can you imagine they went back a little quicker than they walked home? I bet you they made it in under two hours on the way back. They were hauling. And they ran back and they got the disciples together and they walked in and they said, he is risen indeed. That may seem like something we say twice a year at church. Do you know what they're saying? We no longer believe that the women say the tomb was empty. We've seen Jesus. He is risen. It's no longer a story I'm told. It's a story I know. It's no longer something I believe others saw. I now have evidence that God is revealing himself to me, and he is alive. He is active. He came pursuing me, and now I'm going to pursue him. And they celebrate with the disciples, and it changes the world. Has it changed yours? It's truly a question of the morning. Our hearts need to be awakened. If you've been a believer for longer than I've been alive, for 60 plus years you've served the the Lord. Thank you for being an example to my generation. Thank you for the sacrifices and service you've done. But I'm going to tell you this this morning, your eyes can become more open. If you're a person who sits here today and you question whether or not Jesus is real, I want to tell you, I believe 100% Jesus is real, but that's not going to change your heart. But if you might pray a dangerous prayer, Jesus, if you're real, open my eyes and show me he will. You have to open the word of God to know the will of God. You have to open the word of God to know the word of God. If you want to know who Jesus is, search the scriptures and find who he is, and he will open your eyes, he will open your heart, he will change your path, and you'll no longer expect Jesus to pursue you, you'll pursue him. He is risen indeed. I'm betting my life on it. How about you? Because if you tell me you're betting your life on it, it'll change your life. It'll change your priorities. It'll change what you focus your life on. It'll change your goals and visions. It'll make the world think you're throwing your life away. But I'm telling you, you're not throwing your life away. You're actually pursuing someone who pursued you. And when you know who he is, your passion, your heart, and everything's turned to him. Nothing is greater than what Jesus has done for you because nothing is greater than Jesus. And he found you in your moment of discouragement. He revealed himself to you. And sometimes he'll discourage you. And sometimes he'll walk right by you, but he will always lead you. He's always calling you deeper and further up and in to who he is. This is what he did to these two men on Easter Sunday, 2,000 years ago. And I believe he's still doing it today, leading people deeper. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord, that I might see you. Open the eyes of my heart that I might see what you're doing around me. Open the eyes of my heart that I might see a neighbor who just needs someone to care. Open the eyes of my heart that I might see the hurting and the discouraged and the disenfranchised. Father, I am unworthy of everything you've ever shown me, but thank you for everything you've ever shown me about who you are. People have said to God, show me your glory. God's like, that's cute. It would blow your mind if I revealed who I was and all my facets to you. But I will show you this. He gives us a moment of awakening. I will show you this, and we find more awakening. See, there's a pathway of discipleship, church, to pursue Jesus. It includes opening the word of God. It includes times of prayer with God, and it includes community like church. And being in a small community of believers where you're sharing the truth of your life. In a crowd like this, it's tough to be known. In a small group, you're every bit known. And it's what God does to strengthen us. And you want to know what to do next. Then I'm going to say, start with the word of God. Open your Bibles. Don't let your preacher be what you know about scripture. Don't be your small group leader. Don't let them. Don't let mom or dad, grandma or grandpa be who knows the scripture for you. God wants you to get into his word that you might know him and that his plans might be revealed. Where do you start? Go to our resource center on the other side of the cafe. Walk in and say, hey, I want some help in pathways. I want to start a Bible study. I I want some resources that will help me see Jesus in the shadows and the whispers of every text. And we have resources online and here for you. We'll walk with you if you want the help. We'll turn you loose in a group if you want people to join with you. But you, we are here for the purpose of calling people to know who Jesus is deeper. And that pathway of discipleship is when we pursue him because he's already pursued us. And I would pray today, as we already know some have made this decision, that there might be more today who say, Lord, open my eyes. 
that I may begin or continue to pursue you as radically as I've ever pursued anything in my life. Let's stand together.
that you would open our eyes to see you more clearly, that we would recognize our deep need for you and lean deeper into your good presence who is with us. We depend entirely upon you. We need you for my waking breath, for my day. baptism, to be risen to new life with Jesus into his eternal and good kingdom. Will you help me to celebrate that? I 
want to remind you that if you want to have a conversation about who Jesus is, about all that he has done, we would love to talk to you. There are people at the tables with lamps in the back of the room. There are people at the resource center and the lobby. We would love, love, love to have that conversation with you. You guys are dismissed, and we'll see you next week.